Hello everybody, this is Ensign Ricky, your YouTube resident redshirt, and welcome back to the Lower Decks. And in today's video, I'm going to be continuing on with my Understanding Trek series. Today's video will be part two to my ongoing series I call Understanding Trek, a series where I try to do my best to give you a detailed look behind the scenes into the world of Star Trek. In today's video, however, I will be discussing the time after the series' initial cancellation in 1969 up until the animated series' creation in 1975. So, without further ado, let's take a look, shall we, into Understanding Trek Part 2, Rise of the Fandom. it's likely one of us will be killed. The landing party will consist of myself, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Ensign Ricky. Ah, oh, crap. Syndication, Syndication dominance. dominance. In 1969, Star Trek's original series would end, and there would be no fan letter campaign or a merciful act from the studio executives to bring it back. The Gough Western Company had purchased Desilu Studios from Lucille Ball, who at the time was forced to sell. But the company was left with tons of debt. However, after the acquisition, Desilu Studios itself was transformed into the original Paramount Pictures. So in order to help pay off the debt they had acquired, Paramount began selling Star Trek to broadcast in syndication. On a side note, before Lucille Ball had owned Desilu Studios, the production facilities used to belong to RKO Pictures, which was a huge studio and a major player back in the golden age of cinema, who were famous for producing the many musicals starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. While Paramount Pictures might never knew what it had with the Star Trek franchise, other people did take notice of Star Trek's success and the loyal following that the show had created. One such man was Richard Block, president of Kaiser Broadcasting Corporation. Richard is an often unsung hero in Star Trek, but he knew the value of what Star Trek could bring in syndication, and he bought the rights and began rerunning Star Trek all over the country. Richard explains that when he first tried to buy the syndication rights from Paramount, they didn't want to sell, and the show was still on the air, but he kept on asking. Eventually, Paramount caved, and they finally scribbled out a deal on a napkin. When he finally got the rights, he would first air Star Trek in the 11 p.m. time slot throughout the U.S. on all the stations they owned as early as 1970. This was to compete with the news, which would mostly draw an older audience. Star Trek at 11 p.m. blew the news out the water in terms of viewership and gained much attention, as well as a new younger audience who would watch the show before they went to bed. It was so successful, they had to run it five nights a week. Then they played Star Trek in the 6-7 p.m. time slot and ran it on all of their stations. And yet again, it had crushed the news, gaining dominance and showing no signs of stopping. Eventually, everyone that watched TV knew that between 6 and 7 p.m. was the time for Star Trek. Richard Block was so successful with Star Trek that other big stations started to take notice. And it wasn't much longer until they started airing Star Trek on their stations in a similar fashion. Eventually, Star Trek was airing reruns nationwide, both gaining new fans and keeping the hopes of old fans alive. While in syndication, Star Trek would break records and indeed continue to grow immensely. Its fandom had flourished, and fans new and old wanted nothing more than to see the Enterprise on the big screen once again. It wouldn't happen overnight, but their wishes would finally be answered in the form of Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1979. This would all lead into developing one of the strongest, biggest, and first fandoms in history. Beginning of the Fanzine Throughout its time in syndication, Star Trek would gain new fans over the years, while the older fans of the show would continue to talk and speculate about each episode, break down the facts, and debate about them. In the early 70s, there were not many people who were into science fiction. There was no internet to find people who shared the same interests as you, and outside of radio, television, and the newspaper, word of mouth and small out-of-pocket publications is all you got. But as history always shows, us nerds don't go down so easily. We overcome and adapt, and then lo and behold, the unimaginable happened. The fandom spoke out, and fans would start to create the very first fanzines ever dedicated to a television show. 
fanzines were magazine-like publications created by the fans that were compromised of short stories, interviews, and analysis about the show. Also, during its time in syndication, Star Trek would break records, and this eventually led to the production of Star Trek merchandise, and a little bit later on down the line, spawned the very first fan conventions in the early 70s. But it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies. There is a handful of amazing people that kept the Star Trek movement very much alive, and I will discuss them here in a little bit. Just know that these people are as hardcore as Star Trek fans get. They put in a lot of work behind the scenes to start these publications and get them out to the masses, especially without the valuable tools that we have today, such as the internet or personal computers. Without the support of the fans keeping Star Trek alive through the late 60s and early 70s, there is little chance it would have survived at all. I have discussed the importance of Lucille Ball in my last Understanding Trek video. Lucille's importance to Trek cannot be understated, but there are some serious major players during this time period that carried the fandom of Star Trek past the cancellation up until the animated series in 1975. The amazing thing is, a majority of this group that preserved and pushed Star Trek's fandom to new heights was compromised mostly of women, who were just die-hard fans of the show. Many of these amazing ladies came from all walks of life, some of them authors, a librarian, and even a network manager. But the one thing that brought them all together was their love of Star Trek and its lore. In short, we owe all these ladies and gentlemen a huge debt of gratitude because without them and their contributions, it's likely that Star Trek would have just been a small footnote in cinema history. Some of these women would include Jacqueline Lichtenberg, Sandra Marshak, Diva and Deborah Langsam, Sherna Cumberford, Ruth Berman, Joan Winston, B. Joe Trimble, Juanita Coulson, and Elise Rosenstein. All these amazing ladies would lay and preserve the foundation of Star Trek fandom through their serious hard work and dedication. These ladies would produce the first fanzines and network all the fans together via the fanzines and then mail out all these fanzines distributing them nationwide, all of which is a monumental task in the late 60s and early 70s. They would also attend both the national and local science conventions and eventually network with the people there as well. This in turn led them to the idea to create the very first Star Trek convention, which I will explain a little bit later on down the line. These also would be the very first conventions ever dedicated to a television show. It's safe to say that without all the hard work and dedication of these wonderful ladies, we wouldn't have had the 40 plus years of Star Trek afterwards to enjoy. They all deserve a great deal of gratitude. Also, some gentlemen to take note of during this time period include John Trimble, David Gerald, Adam Mallon, Lean Wine, James Blish, Doug Drexler, Ron Barlow, Richard Block, and of course the actors and Gene Roddenberry himself. Again, we owe all these guys a great debt of gratitude for pulling Star Trek through and turning it into what it is today. As early as 1967, when Star Trek was still on the air, fans would make their own publications about the show. This tread would continue on well after the show ended in 1969. One such publication was Spockinalia, which is considered the very first Star Trek fanzine. First created and edited by Deborah Langsam and Sherna Cumberford in 1967, this fanzine contained poetry, art, commentaries, and canon-based stories all made by the fans to show their dedication to Star Trek. These ladies eventually began to network out and started meeting people such as science fiction writers Ruth Berman, Eleanor Arnson, and artist Katie Bushman, who would all lend their support. With that, they finally had a team in place and began producing Spockinalia. Devra and Sherna made it a point to keep the storytelling within the show's canon and not to make up or introduce things that were never in the show. They produced the fanzine as well as distributed it themselves at the World Science Fiction Convention in Manhattan in 1967. Eventually, the fanzine would catch the attention of Gene Roddenberry himself, who was completely blown away by it and loved it. He sent a letter to the ladies thanking them. Roddenberry then made the publication required reading for every new writer or for anyone who makes decisions on show policy. As Spock continued on, it would start to include letters and commentaries from the show's actors, 
its writers such as DC Fontana, and even Gene Roddenberry himself. Roddenberry would later use Spockanalia as a prime example to the studios that Star Trek was very much alive and very much still profitable. Throughout history, Paramount and NBC never knew what they had with Star Trek. If anything, they tried to avoid it like the plague. Dealing with Roddenberry and his lawyers was a huge part of that. But in the end, both Roddenberry and the fandom won. The 1967 World Science Convention itself was a huge turning point in Star Trek history, as many fans attended it, and they were all together for the first time, a fandom united. There was an auction in which Gene Roddenberry was asked by B. Joe Trimble to donate some stuff from the show for the convention. Gene complied, and the Star Trek memorabilia that he donated became the center of attention during the auction. Through the sale of the Star Trek memorabilia, the convention's auction managed to raise over $5,000 in less than two hours. Back then, this was a lot of money. Many fans left the World Science Convention in 1967 with a renewed vigor in Star Trek and started writing stories of their own. Many fans started collaborating with other fans they met there. All in all, a huge win for Star Trek. Other such publications at the time were known as chaos fiction or slash fiction. These were stories that explored the meanderings of a romantic relationship between Kirk and Spock. Jacqueline Lichtenberg explains this by saying that, at that time, fanfic was one of the only ways fans could communicate since there was no internet. She goes on to say that most of the readers at the time were not reading science fiction novels, but romance novels, as that was the most popular genre among both readers and writers. Simultaneously, the gay community was starting to come out of the closet, and there was an express interest in writing stories for them. One overzealous fan wrote a story that explored this Kirk-Spock relationship, but the story got copied over many times, and it went what we consider today as viral, and got widely distributed. This in turn also sparked other fans to write back and join in on the debate, sparking some of the first Star Trek canon debates, except no canons. Get it? Yeah. Uh, anywho, as the Star Trek fandom started to grow, fanfic and fanzines also grew with it and they increased with great popularity. Through both these mediums, fans were able to connect with each other and communicate, which was very important. Since technology was limited in the late 60s and the early 70s, you were considered lucky or perhaps even privileged to have a color TV in your house. Many fans at the time felt alone in their fandom. It was hard to go out and find people that had the same interests as you. You will hear stories from older fans saying that when they were young, they had no idea that anyone liked Star Trek besides them growing up until they found out about conventions and fanzines. Fanfic and fanzines are a huge reason Star Trek pulled through after the show's initial cancellation. In layman's terms, fanfic and fanzines was their social media. Basically, it was their Facebook. But we just don't think about it as much nowadays, because to us, the doorway to eternal knowledge is only a couple mouse clicks away. Another huge player in the fanzine business that also struck its stride with Star Trek was Starlog Magazine. First started in 1976, the magazine grew to adapt science fiction news and content with a heavy emphasis on Star Trek. The first issue sold better than anyone expected, so the magazine went from quarterly releases to bi-monthly releases. When Star Wars came out, it was the biggest thing in Hollywood at the time. With science fiction now getting serious coverage in the news, Starlog basically became the voice of science fiction. Merchandising, merchandising, and merchandising. What's that? Merchandising! With the growing success of Star Trek, there came the growing necessity for Star Trek merchandise. In 1966, a company named AMT signed a deal with Gene Roddenberry for the rights to produce models based on starships. The company's 1966 Enterprise model became one of the company's highest selling kits of all time. The model itself would even light up. AMT would also produce a Klingon D7 battlecruiser, the Galileo shuttlecraft, and even worked with one of Star Trek's most prolific production designers, Matt Jeffries, on his own project spacecraft. Matt Jeffries was responsible for creating the original Enterprise and the D7 Klingon battlecruiser, as well as many other designs that we see throughout Star Trek history. B. Joe Trimble a science fiction writer, along with her husband John Trimble, owned many small yet rather successful mail-order businesses and are very important to Star Trek fandom. They were responsible for the letter-writing campaign to renew Star Trek for a third season. 
in which over 1 million letters were sent to NBC. The Trimbles were also responsible for and very successful for their letter writing campaign to petition President Ford to change the name of the US's first space capable shuttle to Enterprise, in which I will get into a little bit later down the line. The Trimbles, along with Gene Roddenberry, also formed Lincoln Enterprises, a small mail order company in order to sell Star Trek merchandise. This company still exists today as Roddenberry.com. There would be a falling out between Roddenberry and the Trimbles in favor of Majel Barrett running Lincoln Enterprises instead. So the Trimbles went their own way, but they did stay very much heavily involved in Star Trek's fandom. And Majel Barrett Roddenberry would continue to run Lincoln Enterprises. Lincoln Enterprises would sell Star Trek scripts, props, and film clips from the cutting room floor, among other things quite successfully. Then Roddenberry and Stephen E. Whitfield teamed up to create a book named The Making of Star Trek, which gave behind the scenes information on creating the show. Many people, especially people who worked on Star Trek, will tell you that this book was groundbreaking and that this book opened their eyes to the possibility that this could actually be a job. Many claim that this book changed their lives. This was also the first ever book detailing a behind the scenes look at a television show. And then in 1975 in New York City, the Federation Trading Post would open its doors, the first store ever dedicated to a television show. The Federation Trading Post would sell Star Trek merchandise and keep fans of the show updated with current Star Trek news. They would open another store later in Berkeley, California. A famous Star Trek alumni of some serious note also worked at the New York branch, Grammy-winning special effects artist Doug Drexler. Drexler, along with partner Ron Barlow, had enough Star Trek memorabilia to make a small Star Trek museum in the back of the store. Even though at first it looked like an unsuccessful venture, a small group of kids got together and worked to raise the money for a 30-second commercial spot for the store. Needless to say that the commercial was a success. And then the store was packed with lines for the next year straight. This even prompted a visit from Gene Roddenberry himself. Gene congratulated the gentlemen for the great job that they were doing with the store. Drexler and Barlow would later be approached to make the first professional Star Trek magazine that wasn't a fanzine. They created Star Trek Giant Poster Book, but as successful as the New York branch was, it would close three years later and be turned into a small mail order business. However, the Berkeley, California store would stay open and would last quite some time. The Star Trek action figure line was also introduced via the Mego Corporation. The Mego Corporation was a huge toy distributor at the time and had many licenses for many other franchises. And then finally when Mego got the license to produce and sell Star Trek toys, they started with only basic Star Trek toys, like Kirk and Ohora and the main cast. Ultimately, the toy line was so successful that Mego grew the toy line to include other aliens and even toys such as Star Trek walkie talkies. The Rise of Comics and Novels It wasn't too long until Star Trek comics and novels began to appear. A company named Gold Key was writing comics for the series starting in 1968, but only released one issue that year. Then in 1969, released four more issues, but all of them had horrible inaccuracies. A writer working at Gold Key named Lean Wine, who was a Star Trek fan, noticed the problems with the current comics and asked to take the series over. He told the editor that the person who was writing the comic obviously had never seen a Star Trek episode or even knew what Star Trek was. The editor agreed and gave the comic to Ween. Ween then carried out the comic himself for almost three years. Eventually, in 1979, after 61 issues, the Gold Key Star Trek comic line ended. In addition to the comics produced by Gold Key, Star Trek had two other comic strips that ran concurrently in newspapers in both the UK and the US. The UK Star Trek comic strips started out in a weekly comic publication called Joe 90, in which Star Trek and other shows had comic strips dedicated to them. Joe 90 merged with another company called TV21, which again eventually merged into a company called Valiant. The Star Trek comic strip survived all of the mergers and was the most popular comic all the companies had. Again, these strips were wildly inaccurate to Star Trek canon due to the lack of material that the writers and artists had to work with. As we will see later on, that Paramount is notoriously famous for not releasing or giving enough material to these writers or any of these people to work with. Some of these inaccuracies include Captain Kirk's name for many of the earlier issues was Captain Kurt. The whole crew was always way out of character saying lines like, G -g -g great suffering galaxies or suffering starships, Captain. <laughs> 
and the plots of the UK strips? Well, they weren't much better, as we get a strip where Captain Kurt teaches a group of alien gorillas how to play soccer. The UK comic strips started out in 1969, about six months before Star Trek debuted in the UK and ran about five years until 1974, changing many hands in the process. All the UK strips ran in full color and were beautifully drawn, though they were immensely inaccurate due to the insufficient material provided to them by Paramount. These strips were never produced in the US and remain gems to serious Star Trek collectors. The LA Times Syndicate ran the American strips in the newspaper. These strips, unlike the UK strips, were made to adhere to canon and depict a whole new five-year mission. A man named Thomas Warkington launched the series. He notably stuck to canon and even reflected the comic versus the actual Star Trek movies, in some of which were still in the theaters while the comic strip ran. One example is when the Wrath of Khan dropped, the setting and the uniforms were also updated in the comic strip as well. Warkington expanded on the Star Trek canon with more stories involving crew that we didn't normally see on the show too often, like Janice Rand or Nurse Chapel, who both get their turns to save the day. He also includes new stories on some of the aliens we see in the Star Trek movies. Warkington would do the strip for 73 weeks and took the Star Trek comic scene to a whole new level. After Warkington left, the writing team of Charmin Devino and Ron Harris would continue the comic strip for another 71 weeks and stay faithful to what Warkington had started. They even had a comic strip about a mechanical hive mind intelligence seeking to augment humanity that predated the Borg almost by a decade. They would also run a 20-week serial comic strip featuring the return of the Kazinti from the animated series episode, The Slaver Weapon, co-written by the episode's writer, Larry Niven. Eventually, the comic strip would end up in the hands of writers Jerry Conway and Dick Culpa, who also contributed great stories. One such story is about Kirk and McCoy leaving Starfleet and becoming privateers. Another story revolved around the concept of the Enterprise entering a parallel universe where Star Trek is just a regular 20th century TV show. The American comic strips ran from 1979 to 1983 and were printed in black and white, except for Sunday where it was printed in color. These comics were beautifully written and are a treat for any Star Trek fan, but the artwork ranged from okay to horrible and pales in comparison to the beautifully drawn, fully colored UK counterpart. If you are a Star Trek fan, then the US Star Trek comic strips are definitely worth checking out. Novels also began to emerge with author Mac Reynolds penning the first Star Trek novel called Mission to Horatius in 1968. Star Trek's producer at the time, John Meredith Lucas, was worried because the book would conflict with already established canon. Another Star Trek author of some note is James Blish, who also wrote many successful short stories and novels. James Blish's stories also had many breaches of canon, but this was in fact due, again, to the severe lack of material given to the authors by Paramount. Started to see a trend here? So, many other writers started making their own Star Trek novels as the fandom grew more widespread. When the convention scene was in full spread in 1975, Jacqueline Lichtenberg, along with Joan Winston and Sandra Marshak, would pen Star Trek Lives, a book detailing the rise and relationship of Star Trek fandom after its cancellation. Lichtenberg also created a directory of fanzines initiative, where she would put a letter out to all the fanzine publishers to make a comprehensive list for everyone to share. This was very successful, so much they had to make a Star Trek welcome committee to take in the sheer volume of letters to organize the massive directory. Joan Winston would also go on to write an extension to her chapter in the book and release it on its own as The Making of Trek Conventions. This book gives a detailed account on what these ladies went through and contributed to make the Star Trek convention scene happen. But since we are now on the topic of conventions, author David Gerald would also release his book, The World of Star Trek, a non-fiction Star Trek novel in 1973. In his book, he would keep an updated list of all the Star Trek fan clubs and convention dates for all the fans to see. This allowed many fans to meet up with each other, hang out, and attend conventions or do other Star Trek related activities. The convention, the convention scene, scene erupts. erupts. The very first unofficial and official Star Trek conventions were masterminded by a few of the ladies I had mentioned above. As I have said in the past, these ladies don't nearly get the credit they deserve for their contributions to Star Trek and its fandom. 
On March 1st of 1969, just a couple weeks before Star Trek was going to air its last episode, Turnabout Intruder, an episode that was held back because of the news coverage for the death of President Eisenhower, two women decided to throw a Star Trek con at Newark Public Library in New Jersey. Deevra Langsam, a fiction writer, publisher, and editor, along with her partner, Sherna Cumberford, a librarian rented out the library to host a get-together for people who like Star Trek. They had a couple of panel tables, a science speaker, and some show-related materials that Sherna had borrowed, such as slides and clips from the show. It had some local publicity, and it said about 300 people attended the event. The ladies themselves were part of a couple of different sci-fi groups. One was called the Lunarians, a group that would hold a yearly science fiction convention called Lunicon. The other group was called The Committee, which spearheaded the first official Star Trek convention in 1972, titled Star Trek Lives. While attending one of the Lunacon conventions, Deaver Langsam met up with friend Elise Rosenstein, and the latter would come up with the idea to have their own convention, but only about Star Trek. Well, the ladies went ahead with their idea, and in 1972, they rented the Statler Hilton Hotel in New York and got a printer for production of the flyers. They planned for several months beforehand to set up the content that would be presented. They would model this convention in the format of other conventions at the time, with panels, art shows, and costume presentations. Jacqueline Lichtenberg states that both the concept and the news of the convention itself went viral due to the efforts of Joan Winston, who was a television contract manager at the time, and also was extremely well connected with the networks and other media outlets. With the support of the networks, the news of the convention spread like wildfire and ABC and CBS sent camera crews out to the event, but NBC declined to show. This was important because the only other way you could find out about a convention at the time was through word of mouth, since there was very little coverage of these events by the media. Joan Winston also got in touch with NASA, who lent the convention a real spacesuit as an exhibit, but during the convention, an arm off that spacesuit was stolen. With about 900 people pre-registered to come to the event, the ladies only expected a turnout of about 1,000 to 1,500 people. But with the added media coverage of the event, the actual number of people that ended up showing up to the event was more around 3,500. The ladies only produced enough convention material to accommodate maybe around 2,000 people, so they ran out of name badges, program books, and all the trivia contest sheets that they made rather quickly. Uncharacteristically, Paramount also lent the convention full episodes of Star Trek to watch on Friday and Saturday nights, including the very first Star Trek blooper reels. The stipulation was that they couldn't charge people or make money to let people watch the shows. They had a huge dinner in which Majel Barrett was the guest of honor. Majel Barrett herself had been blown away by one of the show viewing rooms because people were watching The Trouble with Triples and quoting the show word for word. There were speeches made at the convention by both Gene and Majel, and as well as prolific writer professor Isaac Asmanov. Needless to say that the very first official Star Trek convention in New York 1972 was a gigantic success, and it paved the way for thousands of more Star Trek conventions to be held all over the world. After the astounding success of the first convention, the ladies immediately started planning the 1973 convention, which again, also turned out to be a huge success, doubling the number of people that attended from 3,500 to almost 7,000 people out of the 10,000 people that had pre-registered to come. The ladies this time around had planned the event just a little better than they did in 1972, renting out a much larger space at the Commodore Hotel in New York and getting more special guests to attend and speak, such as Leonard Nimoy, Mark Lennard, James Doohan, and George Takai. This also marks the first time that any of those Star Trek actors ever attended a Star Trek convention. The ladies, along with the committee, kept going strong, throwing many more successful conventions until they took leave of the convention scene in 1976. They had a friend with a computer and used the computer to make the first digital fan mailing lists, predating many of the big corporations that would later employ this tactic as well. And then in 1974, Al Schuster, the chairman of the committee, parted ways with the organization in order to create his own Star Trek conventions, which, in their own right, were very successful. But on the West Coast, B. Joe and John Trimble also assembled their own committee in order to start throwing conventions. During a conversation while at the San Diego Comic-Con in 1972, the Trimbles, who are always heavily involved in Star Trek, got the idea to make a West Coast-based Star Trek convention, akin to the other one that the ladies were throwing in New York year after year. The final result was Equicon, named after the equinox that happens on Easter. The first Equicon was massively successful, and about eight to 10,000 people showed up. 
It was so large, in fact, that the fire marshal had to come to the event and shut down registration because the venue was already 3,000 people over capacity. The event was a complete success, and even further down the line, as it would too get actors, important speakers, vendors, and entertainment. The first Equicon also donated $2,000 to a school for handicapped children, starting the long tradition of Star Trek fans supporting worthy causes. All these fan-run conventions would indeed spark the fandom and were very successful into the late 70s. Many more Star Trek conventions would start to spring up all over the world, but it wouldn't be long until the convention scene would move away from being run by fans into being licensed and run for profit by Paramount and other businesses, such as Creation Entertainment, who still runs Star Trek Las Vegas and many other Star Trek conventions until this day. These conventions were key in helping Roddenberry prove to the studio and eventually the whole world that Star Trek wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. The first Enterprise and a win for fandom. In 1976, the reaches of Star Trek fandom had stretched so far that when NASA created the first prototype for a space-capable shuttle, fandom had struck again. The president at the time was Gerald Ford, and according to the news, he was going to name the shuttle the Constitution. But two men in Washington, D.C., who are also fans of the show, thought to themselves, shouldn't the first space-capable shuttle that the United States has be called the Enterprise? So once again, the services of B. Joe and John Trimble were called upon to run a mail campaign in order to get President Ford to change the name of the space shuttle to Enterprise. At first they were hesitant because it was an enormous task, but they agreed. They gathered all the help they needed and even got daily calls from Washington DC to check on their progress. All in all, the campaign was a complete success with the fans sending in over 400,000 letters to President Ford. President Ford agreed and the very first shuttle was named the Enterprise. Now, to put it into perspective, it took one million letters to NBC to renew Star Trek for a third season, and it only took a little over 400,000 letters to get the President of the United States to rename a space shuttle to the Enterprise. The Star Trek fandom had won again, and with all the national news coverage behind the story to bolster it, they won big. Both Gene Roddenberry and the actors came down to the event for the shuttle's christening, some people find it ironic, though, that this shuttle was supposed to be named the Constitution, and the Enterprise itself is a Constitution-class starship, a name swap, if you will. Although this may have been the first space shuttle made, it wasn't exactly space-capable and had a lot of issues. The next shuttlecraft, which was named the USS Columbia, was actually the first shuttle they shot into space. But with all that aside, with its dedicated fandom, it was clear and even more evident upon the release of Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1979 that Star Trek was a phenomenon that could clearly not be ignored, showed no signs of stopping, and was here to stay for good. And that concludes part two to my ongoing Understanding Trek series. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope maybe I taught you a thing or two. But for part three, I plan to detail the time from the creation of the animated series in 1975 up into the release of Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1979. But until next time, this is Ensign Ricky, your YouTube resident redshirt, and I'm coming at you from the lower decks, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Peace.